Each video module consists of a video program presenting an overview of the topic and a manual containing much more detailed information as well as exercises. To master each topic, you must use the module's components together, view the video program, read the manual, and work the exercises. Any geologist and drilling engineer will agree that while knowing where to drill is pretty important, knowing how to drill safely and efficiently is also a critical part of the exploration process. On the other hand, once our well is producing, efficient production practices and strategic reservoir engineering are also necessary if we wish to maximize the recovery of the hydrocarbons we've found. However, in between the drilling and the producing, is a critical operation which may very well determine the ultimate success or failure of our well, the completion procedure. A good completion design maximizes the value of a well over its life by optimizing its production rate and minimizing its operating costs in accordance with government regulations and company safety policies. A good completion design must be flexible enough to handle current and future producing problems and yet simple enough to allow its cost-efficient installation and maintenance. There is an enormous diversity in the types of completions found worldwide. However, in general, they are variations on a few basic themes. The most common criteria for classifying completions include, first, the configuration of the interface between well bore and reservoir, either open hole, uncemented liner, or cased and perforated. Second, the production method either pumping or flowing. And third, the number of zones completed, single zone or multiple zones. Let us look first at the interface options. In an open hole completion, the production casing is set just above the producing formation, and the bottom of the hole is deepened and left uncased. The major advantages of an open hole completion include the maximum exposure of pay zone for flow, decreased pressure drawdown during flow, and no formation damage due to cementing or perforating. However, the major disadvantages of an open hole completion are an inability to selectively plug off water or gas zones, and an inability to selectively stimulate separate zones within the productive interval. Our second option, uncemented slotted liners, were first used to prevent collapsing sands in open hole completions from plugging the production system. This type of completion is still found in some areas, but has largely been replaced by gravel packs, which are more effective at stopping sand production. By far the most common type of completion today involves the cementing of the production casing or liner through the pay zone and the subsequent perforating of the casing and cement using shaped charges. This is the cased and perforated completion. This completion type allows us to select the sections of the pay zone we wish to produce, stimulate, or plug off. The cased and perforated completion is generally safer to accomplish and may be cheaper due to reduced rig time. Such completions also permit multiple completion zones within a single well bore. The production method is another general criterion for classifying completions. Flowing wells have sufficient bottom hole pressure to flow the reservoir fluids up the tubing or casing and onto the production facilities. Pumping wells rely on a downhole pump which may be mechanically driven from the surface, hydraulically operated, or electrically powered. Flowing wells may be completed without tubing where flow is up the production casing or with tubing where flow can be up both casing and tubing or up the tubing alone. A tubing and packer installation isolates the casing string from the produced fluids. The tubing may also be designed to fit into the upper end of a casing liner. Pumping wells invariably utilize a tubing string. For multi-zone completions, the key issue is whether or not it is desirable to produce more than one zone at a time. Single string multi-zone completions may be used to deplete zones simultaneously or consecutively. Zones may be alternately produced and shut in. 
dual string completions may be concentric or parallel. Although they allow two zones to be produced simultaneously without being commingled, casing size often limits the diameter of dual tubing strings and consequently the flow rate. Triple string completions are usually too restrictive of individual tubing string capacity to be economically attractive. Also, the difficulty of future remedial work prevents their widespread use. While not a common completion type, sub-C completions are becoming a viable alternative to drilling highly deviated offshore wells or setting multiple platforms. The main concern with subsea wells is the difficulty of access for well servicing. This problem has been addressed with the use of TFL, or through flow line tools, which can be pumped through the flow line and into the tubing. These devices are designed to mechanically operate downhole equipment, which would normally be adjusted via wire line. So we see that a completion may be generally categorized based on its bottom hole configuration, whether it flows or is pumped, and the number of zones it produces. However, within these categories, completions will vary depending on the gross production rate for which they are designed, the well pressure and depth, the rock and fluid properties of the producing zone, and the well surface location. In addition to these parameters, the engineer designing a completion will also need to define the following. What are the functional and well service requirements that are anticipated for the well? What are the drilling considerations that will influence the completion? And what are the company policies and government regulations which influence the design options? Selecting the best completion design for a given situation requires that the engineer consider the present and anticipated future performance of the well and then balance the flexibility of a complex completion design against the investment required for that flexibility. Typically, the cost of completion equipment is relatively insignificant compared to the value of incremental production from improved production capacity. This is why maximizing completion productivity has become the primary goal of much modern completion design. Correctly sizing the production tubing and minimizing formation damage during drilling and perforating are the two most important considerations in maximizing a well's productivity. We remember from modules PE-102 through PE-104 that efficient tubing design recognizes the interrelated nature of each portion of the producing system, the reservoir and well bore, inflow performance, the tubing itself, vertical lift performance, the surface flow control equipment, choke performance, and the surface production equipment. If we test our newly drilled well and establish the relationship between flowing bottom hole pressure and flow rate, we may use this IPR curve as a basis for our design analysis. Using any of a number of vertical multiphase flow correlations, which relate pressure drop up the tubing to variables such as tubing size, water cut, gas liquid ratio, and fluid properties, we can calculate various tubing performance curves. These curves allow us to graphically determine the flow rate for our system for any combination of parameters. For example, the well represented by this IPR curve was tested at a rate of 1,700 barrels per day with a flowing bottom hole pressure of 925 PSIA through 2 and 3 8 inch tubing. Using multi-phase flow correlations, the tubing performance curves for 3.5 inch, 4.5 inch, and dual 2 and 3 8 inch tubing strings may be calculated and plotted. We see that completing the well with 3.5 inch tubing will allow us to produce 2,500 barrels per day, assuming a straight line PI. 4 and 1 half inch tubing allows a rate of 3,150 barrels per day. Of course, the tubing size we may choose for our completion will be constrained by the size of the production casing. But simply choosing the largest possible tubing in order to maximize the initial rate is not a prudent design. For any tubing size, there is a minimum flow rate that is required for continuous removal of liquids. Below this rate, the well will be unstable as slippage of the gas phase through the liquid results in liquid holdup. The larger the tubing diameter we choose, the higher will be the rate at which instability occurs. So by choosing a large diameter tubing string, 
we may be sacrificing long-term producibility for short-term productivity. Also remember that our IPR curve is valid for the current reservoir pressure only, and the tubing performance curve is valid only for the current water cut and gas liquid ratio. Both pressure and flowing characteristics may change radically as the well is produced. Our analysis must consider the expected performance of the well over its entire life. Doing these sorts of calculations for several possible tubing sizes and a variety of flowing conditions can quickly become tedious and time consuming, exactly the sort of work for a computer. Also, we must use our computer and our economic model in order to compare the different tubing size options. The relative cost per foot of our tubing options, the costs and timing of future workovers, the product price projections, and the applicable discount rate will all affect the present value of each tubing design alternative. The second main consideration in getting a well to achieve its productive potential is minimizing formation damage and the resultant reduction in near well bore permeability. The primary causes of formation damage are invasion of drilling mud solids or filtrate into the formation, expansion of water sensitive native clays, and the invasion of solids from the completion fluid into the formation. Research has shown that the solid particles carried into the formation pores are the main cause of permeability impairment. And such impairment is dependent on the size of the particles and the permeability of the formation. Shallow invasion of these particles will occur when their diameter is roughly 10 to 30 percent of the mean pore diameter of the formation, as indicated by this table. It is easier to damage higher permeability reservoirs because fluid losses can carry solids deeper into the formation. Formation damage caused by drilling fluids may be minimized by properly sized mud solids, which quickly form a protective filter cake, drilling with clear filtered weighted fluids, underbalanced drilling, and post-drilling stimulation. Particularly when drilling with freshwater muds, mud filtrate invasion can cause permeability reduction due to the swelling of native clays and their dispersion in the pores of the formation. Low concentrations of potassium or calcium chloride in completion fluids have been found helpful in preventing such damage. Although the perforating process itself always causes some damage due to the crushing of the rock surrounding the perforation, the major causes of perforating damage are solids plugging during overbalanced perforating, and inadequate perforation density and or length. Underbalanced perforating using through tubing or tubing conveyed techniques and the use of clear filtered completion brines hold the greatest promise for reducing such damage. A minimum of four shots per foot, preferably more, properly sized charges and centralized guns can also increase the number of perforations contributing to flow. The importance of clean completion fluids cannot be overemphasized. Careful rinsing of mud tanks, removal of scale, rust and paint from drill pipe, minimal use of pipe dope on connections, and constant monitoring of filtering elements are drilling procedures which are becoming standard practice with many companies. The added cost of these procedures is more than offset by the improvement in productivity. In this unit, we have briefly reviewed the basic types of completion options available to the engineer. Selecting the best option requires that the designer consider the present and future performance of the well, the constraints imposed by the drilling program, applicable regulations and policies, and the feasibility of new technology. Maximizing productivity, often of overriding importance in the economic design of a completion, can be achieved by correctly sizing the tubing string and minimizing formation damage. In the next unit, we shall look more closely at the equipment utilized in different types of completions. Some of the considerations in the design of the tubing string itself will be covered first. Please read sections one and two in your manual and work the appropriate exercises before continuing.
tubing makes up the largest portion of the completion string. It must be designed to withstand the stresses of installation and also the stresses that are brought about by changing pressures and temperatures throughout the life of the producing well. In addition to the tubing, there are packers, landing nipples, safety valves, and a variety of other components which will make up the flow conduit from the bottom of the well to the surface flow line. In this unit, we shall describe each of these components and their functions using examples that are available here at the Baker Training Center in Houston, Texas. First, the tubing. In designing a tubing string, we must determine the stresses that will be applied to the tubing throughout its life. Then, we must choose a tubing which will withstand those stresses along with a suitable safety factor. We are concerned with three failure modes. Bursting of the tubing due to excess internal pressure, collapse of the tubing due to excess external pressure, and tensional failure of the pipe or couplings due to tensional loads. The most severe burst loading occurs at the surface during pressure testing, well killing, and stimulation procedures. At this point, the greatest degree of pressure differential exists between the inside of the tubing and the annulus. The most severe collapsed loading occurs downhole, particularly in gas wells or high GOR oil wells with low flowing bottom hole pressures, during annulus pressure tests and during underbalanced perforating. Tubing strings are not only subjected to running tensions with the associated shock and acceleration loadings, but also to operating stresses due to piston forces on any valves, plugs, or reduced IDs in the tubing string. Moreover, if the tubing is anchored or held by a packer, its operating tension will vary as a result of thermal effects, piston effects, ballooning effects, and buckling effects. Let's look at each of these. Changes in temperature due to the production of hot fluids and or the injection of cold or hot fluids will cause the tubing string to expand and contract. This will result in a change in tubing length. With a long tubing string and extreme temperature change, the change can be significant, perhaps several feet. The change in tubing length is equal to the change in average temperature times the total length of the tubing times the coefficient of expansion of steel. If the tubing is anchored to the packer, this will be translated into a tensional or compressional force at the packer. If the tubing is free to move, this movement will require the appropriate length of sealing elements to prevent leakage. The most familiar form of piston effect is that of the stretch induced when making an internal pressure test against a plug set inside the tubing string. Where the tubing is inserted into a packer, we must simultaneously consider the piston effects on the cross section of the steel, which is affected by changes in the internal and external pressure. The piston force at the packer related to a difference in the inside and outside pressure is equal to the area exposed to the internal pressure times the change in internal pressure minus the area exposed to external pressure times the change in external pressure. The change in tubing length related to this piston force is the force times the total length of tubing divided by the cross-sectional area of the tubing times the modulus of elasticity of steel. Ballooning is a shortening of the tubing string resulting from a difference in internal and external pressure and a force generated by the drag of fluids on the internal wall of the tubing during flow. Thus, ballooning occurs under static and flowing conditions. The equation relating the change in tubing length to the fluid and tubing parameters and the flowing conditions is given in your manual. Helical buckling of a free-moving tubing string is caused by the differential between the tubing internal and external pressures acting on the full cross-sectional area of the packer bore at the tubing seal. Where a packer limits the movement of the tubing, a packer to tubing force must also be considered. The total change in tubing length resulting from these various effects, thermal, piston, ballooning, and buckling, can be summed. And the effect of this net change on the tubing stress will depend on the amount of motion permitted by the packer design. This stress, along with the collapse and burst conditions, must be analyzed prior to choosing a tubing design. The choice of whether or not to use a packer that permits tubing movement will depend on this analysis. Packers are used for many reasons, the most common of which are to protect the casing from well fluids and pressure, 
to separate zones in the same well bore, to keep treating fluids in the annulus, to allow for gas lift or hydraulic power fluid injection, to isolate perforations or leaks, and to facilitate temporary well servicing operations. Packers are primarily classified as retrievable, permanent, permanent retrievable, and inflatable. Let's look at each type individually. Retrievable packers are run on the tubing. After setting by mechanical or hydraulic means, they can be released and recovered on the tubing. Since it is an integral part of the tubing string, the tubing cannot normally be removed from the well without pulling the packer. Mechanically set packers are usually set in compression by rotation, reciprocation, or set down weight. Hydraulically set retrievable packers are usually set in tension by applying hydraulic pressure through the tubing string. Retrievable packers are usually used for complex multi-zone and multi-string completions. Because of the setting mechanism, retrievable packers tend to have a restrictive bore and will generally not allow as large a tubing to be run in a given size casing as some other packers. Permanent packers are independent of the tubing and may be run on tubing or on wireline. The tubing or wireline can be released from the packer and removed from the well, leaving the packer as an integral part of the casing. As such, a permanent packer cannot be recovered but must be destructively removed if necessary. If the packer includes a tailpipe and mill-out extension, a special milling and retrieval tool can be used to remove the packer. Otherwise, it may be simply milled up and pushed to the bottom of the hole. Permanent packers are used when high formation pressures and temperatures are present, when repeated removal of the tubing without unseating the packer is required, where tubing operating stress variations would cause a retrievable packer to unseat or be impossible to pull, and where large diameter tubing is required. The permanent retrievable packer incorporates several of the features of each type. It has essentially the same characteristics as the permanent packer, but can be released by using a special pulling tool. Inflatable packers are sometimes used as open hole packers or when collapsed casing prevents the use of conventional packers. They cannot stand high pressure differentials and are generally limited to special applications such as drill stem testing. Tubing anchors are used to prevent tubing movement in rod pumped wells. They are basically of three types. Tension anchors, which permit the tubing to elongate, but not to shorten. Compression anchors, which permit shortening, but not elongation. And fixed anchors. Most anchors used today are of the fixed type and have two main setting and retrieval mechanisms, rotational and hydraulic. It is best to select an anchor with a dual retrieval mechanism so that if the primary one fails, for example, rotation, a secondary release can be utilized, such as shear pins. There is a variety of common downhole tubing components that are often found in completion designs. These include seating nipples, landing nipples, sliding sleeves, also called sliding side doors or circulating sleeves, side pocket mandrels, blast joints, flow couplings, and subsurface safety valves. Let's briefly look at each of these components. Seating nipples are integral components of the tubing string, which have a polished bore and an internal diameter slightly less than the tubing drift diameter. Usually, a locking profile is machined from the internal diameter of the nipple. There are three main types of seating nipples. Pump seating nipples, selective landing nipples, and non-selective or no-go landing nipples. Pump seating nipples are utilized to land and seal off a bottom hole pump run into the well on a string of sucker rods. Selective landing nipples and the devices that are set inside them are used to permit the setting of wireline plugs in order to allow pressure testing of the completion or the setting of hydraulic packers, to provide a place to set safety valves, bottom hole chokes, bottom hole pressure bombs and tubing plugs, to pack off tubing leaks, and to temporarily plug the well and allow the removal of tubing or surface equipment. Selective landing nipples have a common internal diameter, 
but come with a variety of distinctive internal locking profiles. Thus, when one or more nipples are required in a tubing string, several different profiles can be incorporated into the design, allowing wireline tools to set only in that profile for which the tool setting mechanism is designed and to pass through all others. No-go landing nipples are designed with a slightly restrictive ID and are usually located at the bottom of the tubing string to prevent wireline tools from inadvertently running out of the tubing. Another common tubing string component is the sliding sleeve, also known as a sliding side door or circulating sleeve. This component is operated by a wireline tool which engages a profile in the tool and shifts the sleeve open or closed, providing easy access from the tubing to the tubing casing annulus, either for fluid circulation or to permit a previously isolated zone to be produced. Several reasons for using sliding sleeves include to kick off a well by displacing the tubing contents with a low density fluid. To kill a well with a high density fluid prior to pulling the tubing or working the well over. To replace the completion fluid with a corrosion inhibited packer fluid. To test a subsurface safety valve. Or to temporarily produce a selective zone. The quality of the elastomer seals in the sliding sleeves is important to prevent leakage and allow easy operation. The technology behind these seals has improved in past years. Some designers use a side pocket mandrel as another means of wireline operated access to the tubing casing annulus. This cutaway shows how these eccentric nipples accommodate a valve in parallel to the tubing and are used to install wireline retrievable gas lift valves, circulation valves, flow control valves, and injection valves. The most common usage of these mandrels for gas lift valves is discussed in detail in module PE-105, Gas Lift. Often, these mandrels will be placed just above the top packer in a high-pressure gas well completion to allow a controlled circulation kill in the event a lower circulation sleeve is inaccessible or to allow for the injection of corrosion inhibitor into the tubing string continuously or in batch treatments. Other common tubing components include blast joints and flow couplings. These special joints of tubing have greater wall thickness and are usually manufactured from special heat-treated steel. To prevent the abrasion of produced fluids from wearing a hole in the long string tubing, blast joints are placed opposite the upper perforations in a multi-string well. Sometimes these components are constructed of tungsten carbide or very hard ceramic materials. Where protection needs to be provided against tubing leaks caused by erosion due to turbulence, the smooth polished surface and thick walls of the flow coupling help to reduce erosion. Still another downhole tubing component is the subsurface safety valve. Such a valve provides a downhole shutoff that will limit the amount of fluid escaping from the well should severe damage occur to the surface flow control equipment, such as an offshore platform being damaged by a storm or struck by a ship, or if a landslide or a truck should collide with an onshore wellhead. There are two basic types of subsurface safety valves, the flow controlled valve and the surface controlled valve, the second of which may be wireline retrievable or tubing retrievable. The flow controlled valve is a wireline retrievable valve held open by spring tension. The valve is designed to remain open during normal flowing conditions, but snap shut if the tubing pressure drops radically or the production rate exceeds a preset limit. The valve is reopened by raising the pressure on the downstream side in excess of the closed-in bottom hole pressure. One disadvantage of this type of subsurface safety valve is that it requires an accurate knowledge of well behavior, temperature, and flowing conditions. This information is required in order to set the valve accurately so that it will close when required but not when normal fluctuations in well performance occur. The choke or bean in the device is also an obvious restriction to flow. On the other hand, these valves are relatively cheap and can easily be set deep in the well below the packer, protecting both the tubing and the annulus. The surface controlled subsurface safety valve, or SCSSV, is a fail close valve which is held open by a high pressure control line which is run alongside the tubing string down to the depth at which the valve is located. The control line is generally connected at the surface to an emergency shutdown system, 
which automatically shuts in the well if unsafe conditions are detected, for example, a fire or gas detection. There is usually a control panel with pressure gauges and controls for all the wells on an offshore platform. The safety valves can be tested, closed, and reopened using hydraulic pressure. Such valves are the most commonly used today, and in some countries, such as the United States, they are required in all offshore wells and onshore sour wells. These valves may be wireline retrievable or tubing retrievable. The wireline retrievable surface controlled subsurface safety valve is installed in a landing nipple, such as we see here. This nipple has a port through which the control line communicates with the valve between this set of packings, which as we see right here. This type of valve typically has a service life of 18 to 24 months and therefore requires easy wireline access. Usually the restricted bore of these valves requires that they be pulled before wireline work can be carried out below their setting depth. The tubing retrievable SCS SSV is an integral part of the tubing string and as a result has a larger through bore than the retrievable type valves. It is not so dependent on elastomer seals as the wireline retrievable type and has a much longer service life, usually 5 to 20 years. Since tubing retrievable valves require an expensive rig workover to pull the tubing should they fail to operate correctly, these valves are often backed up with a nipple section designed to accept a wireline retrievable valve. After the original inoperable valve is locked open, these valves come in a variety of designs which may have single or dual hydraulic control lines, either ball type or the flapper type valve mechanisms, and special material designs for sour, sandy, or high pressure service. The setting depth for subsurface safety valves is often a matter of government regulation and company policy. When drilling and production is undertaken concurrently on an offshore platform, Many companies like to set the valves beyond the kickoff point so that they can be used to shut in the well during the top hole drilling and kickoff of an adjacent well. Other designers prefer to install the valve near the surface and avoid subjecting it to bending stresses. However, these valves are normally set at least 150 or 50 meters below the surface or sea floor. Although not valves in the strict sense of the word, Bottom hole chokes and regulators are often used with the objective of limiting the rate at which a well could produce uncontrolled, thereby limiting the surface operating pressures and limiting the drawdown on wells that tend to produce sand. Chokes are designed to give a constant rate with varying surface pressures, while regulators give a constant pressure differential as rates vary. Another safety device sometimes used in injection wells is a simple check valve which permits injection but not production, preventing backflow of water and formation sand should injection temporarily cease. These then are the common, most common downhole components in modern well completions. The tubing itself, of course, one or more packers, possibly a tubing anchor for a pumping well, a variety of landing nipples to allow the wire line setting and retrieval of various plugs and devices sliding sleeves and side pocket mandrels to permit controlled access to the annulus, blast joints and flow couplings to minimize abrasion, and finally subsurface safety valves to shut in the well in case of an emergency. Of course there are other downhole completion components which have been developed for special problems and operating conditions. Often the best way to become familiar with these items is to spend some time reviewing the completion diagrams for the wells in your area and looking up any unfamiliar equipment in the supplier's catalog. Your supervisor or lead engineer will also inform you about the historical design policies or practices of your group. But while we're on the subject of completion equipment, let's briefly review the role of well heads and surface flow control and artificial lift equipment the equipment that gives us the only obvious surface indication of the type of completion in the well. This equipment is discussed in more detail in several other modules of the video library, so we shall talk about it only briefly and with regard to its importance to the completion operation. Wellheads typically are the joint responsibility of the drilling department that installs the casing head and casing spools during the drilling operation 
and the production department, which in some companies may take over the completion procedure and install the tubing head and surface flow control equipment, also called the Christmas tree or simply the tree. This equipment is designated by its size and pressure rating, which are dictated by such design considerations as tubing sizes, casing sizes, kill and stimulation pressures, flowing pressures, operating temperatures, space requirements and surface location, and government regulations or company safety policies. The standard wellhead pressure ratings in PSI are shown here. Wellhead components for low pressure installations may be threaded but flanged connections or clamped connections are used in the high and intermediate pressure ranges. The production casing is hung off inside the wellhead or casing spool, and the tubing head packs off around the production casing. The tubing head allows access to the tubing casing annulus, and the pressure ratings of its upper and lower flanges must be compatible with the tree and the casing spool, respectively. The bore and size of the top flange must permit the passage of the tubing and packer and allow the installation of the completion rig's BOP stack. The pressure rating of the tubing head spool is often dictated by stimulation pressure requirements and may therefore be of a higher rating than the Christmas tree, which can be removed or protected during stimulation. The most common type of tree is the assembled tree, consisting of a flange or bonnet, one or more master valves, a T or flow cross, a swab valve, a crown plug, one or more wing valves, a choke, and a flow line valve. The assemblage makes up the surface flow control equipment. Full opening gate valves are used for the master and swab valves and often for the other valves as well. These should not be opened when a significant differential pressure exists across the closed valves. The wing valve should be used to open and close the well for routine operations. Trees rated at 5,000 PSI and less are normally pressure tested to twice the working pressure. And trees rated at 7,500 to 20,000 PSI to 1.5 times the working pressure. In flowing wells, the rate is controlled by a bean or choke. Historically, the most common device was the fixed bean operating under critical flow conditions so that fluctuations in downstream pressure did not affect upstream pressure and rate. Adjustable chokes are used to allow quick changes of the well's flow rate. If a well is incapable of flow when it is initially completed, some type of artificial lift will be necessary to maintain production. Of the five main methods of artificial lift, rod pumping is by far the most widely utilized method in onshore North America. On the other hand, gas lift is the primary method in most offshore fields. With electrical, submersible, and hydraulic pumps, finding application in special circumstances. Each of these artificial lift methods is discussed in the seven modules that make up the production performance series of the video library. Specifically, modules PE 105, 106A, and 106B. As a completion designer, the choice of artificial lift method will largely be dictated by the space and servicing limitations the availability of power or compression facilities, the depth and operating conditions of the well, and the experience and availability of field personnel and service representatives. Many low to moderate rate onshore wells producing less than 2,000 barrels per day are completed with beam pumps because of their ability to provide high formation drawdowns and their familiarity to operators. From a completion standpoint, the key considerations are an open annulus with exposure of the casing. The need to anchor the tubing to prevent buckling. An adequate pump diameter to displace maximum volume. The need to install a pump seating nipple. A requirement of easy access for pulling rods or tubing. And properly sized rods and units to transmit power to the subsurface pump effectively. Many moderate to high rate producers, particularly offshore where space is at a premium, utilize continuous or intermittent gas lift as an artificial lift method. From a completion standpoint, the key issues in a gas lift design are sizing the tubing, the requirement of a packer, and determining the number and setting depths of the gas lift valves. The setting depths are a function of the kill fluid and produced fluid gradients, the system pressure the well is being produced into, and the gas supply pressure. 
Future conditions for all of these variables must be estimated in order to design a completion that will remain efficient. The use of side pocket mandrels increases the flexibility of gas lift completions by allowing for the addition or subtraction of valves over time without requiring the removal of a tubing string. Wells that produce large volumes of low gas liquid ratio fluids are good candidates for electrical submersible pumps. The critical limitation is the casing size, which will limit the size of the pump that can be lowered to the bottom of the well, and thus its horsepower and capacity. In addition, submersible pump completions must have an open annulus, a special wellhead for sealing around the power supply cable, adequate cable protection, adequate cooling of the motor, and of course, adequately sized tubing for handling large volumes. Hydraulic and plunger lift installations are covered in your manual. And remember, the details on the equipment design of each of the artificial lift methods is found in other modules of the video library. With this general understanding of the equipment components of common well completion designs, we can begin to understand the variety of options available to the design engineer faced with a particular completion problem. But the temptation to design a complex completion that will be flexible enough to handle any future production behavior must be tempered by the realization that such complex completion operations take longer to perform and often multiply the risks and costs of the well. In the next unit, we will briefly outline the major categories of completion operations and their important points. Each of these operations is covered individually in this series. We shall also discuss the need to carefully plan the completion procedure. For now, please read section three in your manual and work the appropriate exercises before continuing. In this unit, we shall introduce the basic completion operations, cementing of the production casing, cased hole logging, perforating for production, and stimulation and sand control procedures. Ending up this unit and the module will be a discussion of the important considerations in planning a completion program. Cementation of the production casing is probably the operation having the greatest impact on the achievement of an effective completion in a simple cased and perforated well. The cement must be properly formulated and mixed. The mud cake lining the hole must be removed. The casing must be carefully centered in the hole. The proper accessory tools must be selected and incorporated into the casing string. And the cement displacement technique must be designed so that the combination of fluid head, friction, and surge pressures does not break down the exposed formations. In addition, swabbing during movement of the casing string and any loss of head during the cement setting process must be minimized in order to maintain control of the well and prevent the flow of formation fluids into the annulus. Reciprocation of the casing string during cement displacement is one technique for removing mud cake and providing a more even placement of cement, helping to ensure a good bond. However, if the primary cementing procedure is not effective, Remedial cementing will be necessary to complete the placement of cement over the entire interval required. Remedial cement jobs include a block squeeze between barriers, a low pressure squeeze from the pay zone, or a circulation type recementation. Remedial cementing is also undertaken during workover operations to isolate zones, repair a casing leak, plug near well bore fractures, and to perform various types of plug backs. High pressure squeeze cementing will not prevent vertical migration of fluids with a cement barrier because the cement sheet will be vertical rather than horizontal. Remedial operations are therefore designed to be low pressure squeezes with the objective of filling the uncemented volume behind the casing often using a series of pressure cycles. Once pipe has been set, of course, open hole logs can no longer be run. However, there is still a need for subsurface data to determine where to perforate, to determine the quality of the cement bond, and to determine where to set plugs. 
Also, throughout the life of the well, some method of identifying additional zones of potential production and of monitoring changes in the fluid distribution behind the casing is required. Cased hole logs, also called production logs, are used for this purpose. During a completion, the two most common cased hole logs are the gamma ray casing collar log, run to correctly identify the proper depth for perforations or packer settings, and the cement bond log variable density log, run to evaluate the effectiveness of the cement seal in the casing formation annulus. Depth control is the primary responsibility of the on-site drilling or production engineer. Unfortunately, a common cause of poor well performance is an incorrectly perforated completion zone, resulting from poor depth control during perforating. To avoid this, always plot the proposed shot depths on a reference log and avoid reliance on verbal orders. Always use a gamma ray casing collar log for correlation with the original open hole logs to determine cased hole wireline depths. When running casing, always place at least one odd size casing joint in or near the pay zone for easy identification. Carefully correlate the gamma ray casing collar log to the reference log, making sure a significant number of correlating points are made. And carefully measure the tool distances between the casing collar locator and the gamma ray detector and perforating charges. The cement bond log relies on the attenuation of a reflected sound pulse. If the pipe is uncemented, that is, if the cement bond is poor, the sound wave amplitude is very high and the pipe rings. If the pipe is constrained, that is, if the cement bond is good, sound transmission is attenuated and the amplitude of the signal is low. The variable density log performs a sort of seismic survey to determine the quality of the cement bond to the formation. By comparing the cement bond log data from a known well-cemented section of the hole with the zone of interest, usually the productive interval, a relative measure of cement bond quality is determined. In order to prevent unwanted movement of reservoir fluids, particularly the invasion of water into a gas or oil zone or cross-flow between productive formations of different pressures, good hydraulic isolation behind casing is necessary. Other types of logs are sometimes used during the completion process but are more commonly brought into play when analyzing production problems or during workovers. The logs commonly termed production logs are used primarily for determining the type and source of fluids moving downhole. After a well has been evaluated and production casing has been securely cemented in place, it is necessary to perforate the production casing unless an open hole completion is planned. This is accomplished by using shaped charges to generate a high pressure, high speed jet which punches a hole through the pipe, cement, and formation. The primary concerns are to prevent immediate plugging and to optimize perforation number and length. As mentioned earlier, the negative pressure differential present in underbalanced perforating has often been found to be superior to conventional perforating because it allows formation fluid to immediately expel any debris from the perforations. There's a range of recommendations on just how much underbalance should be permitted. Typically, oil reservoirs with good permeability should be perforated with between 200 and 500 psi of differential between the formation and the wellbore. Research has shown that the most important parameters affecting completion performance are shot density and penetration. Perforations must extend at least 2 inches or 5 centimeters beyond any drilling damage, but once this is achieved, shot density becomes much more important than further penetration. The minimum shot density should be 4 shots per foot, 13 shots per meter, and preferably 8 to 12 shots per foot, 26 to 40 shots per meter. Hole size and phasing are generally thought to be less important, although a spiral pattern will have a lower skin effect than a linear phasing. Internal gravel packs require large perforations, and limited entry fracturing requires small perforations, but Half-inch holes are common for most normal completions. Selection of the perforation interval is often a joint responsibility of the production engineer, reservoir engineer, and geologist. Primary concerns are, do shale breaks isolate sand bodies, and must each productive zone be perforated to recover all reserves? Is there a danger of coning or cusping water or gas into the oil-productive perforations? 
Should intervals be left unperforated in anticipation of future workovers requiring packers or plugs? Stimulation, either acidizing, fracturing, or both, is often a routine part of the completion operation, particularly in developed areas where the need for such action is known. The objective of fracturing is to create a super perforation, exposing a great deal of sand face to well inflow pressure. The fracture must be highly permeable compared to the surrounding rock. Therefore, fracturing is not normally applied to formations of more than 75 millidarcy's permeability. If the permeability contrast between formation and fracture is very high, or the fracture penetration is very deep, or if significant drilling damage had occurred, spectacular, perhaps five-fold increases in productivity can be observed with fracturing. Acidizing treatments generally refer to acid treatments performed at pressures below fracture pressure. Matrix acidizing involves the injection of an acid solution into the pore structure of the formation without parting the rock. This is primarily done to remove drilling fluid damage. Hydrochloric or HCl acid, normally 7.5 or 15% strength, and hydrofluoric or HF acid, normally 3% strength, are the most commonly used acids. HCl acid will dissolve calcium carbonate, a primary component of limestone, and HF acid will dissolve some clay particles. But the hydraulic activity of the injection process is most important in removing damaging solids. A mixture of HF and HCl acids called mud acid is commonly used on sandstone formations containing clays. Finally, sand control measures are often an important part of the completion operations in areas where sand production is a problem. Although almost all wells produce some formation fines, when the load-bearing particles of unconsolidated formations are carried along with the produced fluids, erosion of downhole and surface equipment will develop, and bridging of the particles in the tubing may actually sand the well up. It is important to determine the chances for sand production prior to designing the completion, so that the necessary gravel pack or sand consolidation can be incorporated into the design. This is done via well tests, core analysis, log analysis, and historical trends for a given area. Use of the slotted liner mentioned in Unit 1 was an early method for preventing sand production, which has given way to more modern techniques. Sand consolidation, the artificial cementation of near wellbore sand grains with a plastic resin, has found some success in thin, less than 10 feet thick, high porosity zones. This technique is simple in concept, but difficult to accomplish. Precise placement of the resin and its activator requires that pumped volumes be carefully calculated and monitored. Over or under displacement will result in continued sand production or a plugged well. Gravel packing, by far the most effective and commonly used sand control technique, packs a layer of clean, sorted, highly permeable quartz sand grains between the formation face and a wire-wrapped screen. This can be done inside the perforated casing, provided the casing and perforations are designed to accommodate the packing sand. It can also be done in an open, uncased hole, in some cases an under-reamed open hole, to provide maximum productive area for flow. Such external gravel packs are difficult to plan and install effectively. Lost circulation, mixing of the gravel pack sand with formation sand, and stuck tools are just a few of the common problems that make internal gravel packs much more common. The most important part of designing a gravel pack is the correct sizing of the gravel pack sand based on samples of the formation sand and the correct sizing of the wire wrapped screen based on the sand size. Once ordered, samples should be taken to ensure that the packing sand is clean and well sorted. At least 93% of the grain should be of the specified size. Some companies wash and rescreen the sand prior to pumping it into the well. Cementing, cased hole logging, perforating, stimulation, and sand control. All procedures which are typically done during the completion program and which are covered in detail in their own modules in the video library. Now let's step back for a moment and look at some considerations in the planning of a completion operation. It has been said that the key to good, cost-effective completions is to apply the KISS principle, keep it simple and safe. 
However, the trend toward deeper, more hostile drilling environments and the need to control costs by anticipating future problems and designing for them can make this principle a real challenge to apply. There are two extremes to avoid when designing a completion. The tendency to copy the previous or offset well program and the tendency to redesign each well from first principles. Both routes miss out on some very valuable information. Wells differ significantly, even within a given field, and conditions can change. Moreover, our own expertise and understanding of a field constantly grows as new technology and new information become available. So we should never hesitate to re-examine our assumptions, our policies, and standard designs from time to time. Before beginning a completion design, the engineer should collect and review the location elevations, casing and wellhead specifications, drilling data, the geological description of the pay zone, any pressure tests or logs collected in the well or offsets, the cementing data on each casing string, any special completion requirements anticipated by the geologist or reservoir engineer, and finally, the performance of any offset wells, their completion designs, and the reservoir development plan. The engineer should prepare a depth versus pressure plot showing mud weights, reservoir pressures, fracture pressure, operating and kill conditions, completion fluid gradient, and perforating conditions. A reference log over the pay zone interval should be prepared showing tests, problems, fluid contacts, casing points, cement tops, and plugback depths. And a status diagram should be developed to concisely state the present condition of the well, showing casing points and cement tops. There are several checklists in your manual to help you find and organize the field and well data needed for this planning procedure. A good production engineer will have a book of status diagrams for each well under his or her supervision. Each schematic should be up to date with any new information from wireline work, well servicing, major workover, or production logging. When a new well is completed, the final completion data should be summarized in this form. The quality of a completion design depends not only on the equipment and techniques selected, but also upon the experience of the crews and supervisor. A clearly written, easy-to-use completion procedure is necessary to ensure that all work is completed correctly. A good procedure will detail exactly how a job is to be done anticipating problems and providing contingencies. Rig time is usually the most costly item in a completion and careful planning can avoid inefficiency. Your manual has additional detail on the data required, onshore and offshore regulations, cost estimating, scheduling and supervision. Please be sure to read section 5 carefully. In this module then, we have introduced the topic of completion design a critical part of the exploration and development process with fundamental effects on the productivity and profitability of a well. In the remaining modules of the 300 series of the video library, we shall return to each of the major completion operations for more detail. But for now, carefully read sections 4 and 5 in your manual and work the last set of exercises. Good luck.